Hey everybody, in today's video I'm going to go over 15 Excel functions that all accountants should know. I used to work in accounting and so I know a lot of these functions are used often and can be very helpful in your day-to-day -day tasks. So ranging from beginner to inter intermediate functions, there's a lot covered here. And I'll leave a link to the post related to this video where you can download the, the worksheet that I'm working on right now that has... Uh, the sample data for for sales and all these all these fields that I'm going to use in these calculations. So if you want to follow along, you can download that and uh, practice as 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 I go with this. So the first one on my list is the sum function. Now the sum function is a very basic function in Excel, but it's a really important one to know, especially when you're when you're starting out, just to be able to know how how to use it. And the sum function works really. Um, it is really simple. All you're really doing is, you know, tabulating an entire column or, or a range. So the formula, you know, you can just type in equals sum and select the entire column. Like if you want to total sales, all of column G, hit enter. We don't actually have to close the parentheses. You'll notice that Excel will do that for us. So, so it's a lazy way of finishing your uh, your formula, but you can do it that way. And you can also use the auto sum button if you're directly underneath um, your data set. So if I went all the way to the bottom here and hit the auto sum button, it'll automatically detect my, my range there and do the same thing as if I were to do the sum function. But for this example, since it's not directly underneath, uh, since my formula isn't underneath, I'm gonna use the sum function to just select that. So a really easy way to uh, tabulate the uh, the total sales from my data set. Now another useful function is the average function. Again, not a terribly hard function to learn, similar to the sum. All you're really doing is selecting the average function. And by the way, as you're typing in these uh, functions, as you get the one you need, right now I don't have to spell out average entirely. I can hit tab once it's highlighted the one that I want. So once I'm here, I can hit tab and it'll auto auto fill the rest of the function name for me. And to pull the average again, I'm just selecting whatever I want to average. So the total sales column again, column G. So the average sale was that. So two really easy functions to, to start out with. Now a really important function that I think all users should know is how to use the if statement in Excel because the if statement is used in a lot of other um, functions anytime you're, c you're creating conditional rules an if statement can be really helpful in um, in deciding which value you want to assign so I'm gonna create I'm gonna create the if statement here I'm just gonna create a separate whole separate field for it because what I want to do is evaluate every single line on here and so with an if statement just open it up. And so we have our logical test. So this is where we're looking for some sort of criteria. So let's say I want to look at, a, at this product line field and say, okay, is this value equal to motorcycles, right? Motor cycles. And then if it is, I'll assign a value of one. If it's not, I'll assign a value of two. So simple enough. And I can double click to copy this down. So you'll notice all these ones that are motorcycles are ones. Once I get down here to classic cars, these are twos. And back to one for motorcycles, two for classic cars. So you can see a really simple function, but incredibly useful because once you know how, how that works, you can incorporate that into other functions as well. And that brings me to another important function called the sum if function. And this one combines sum and if. So it shows you how how this can work when combining that. So the sum if function, open it up. This time we've got a range, a criteria range, and a sum range. So the first range is going to be for our criteria. So going back to the earlier uh, example, we're looking at the product line to see if it's motorcycles. Now what we can do is select this entire column and say, okay, if these values are motorcycles then the range that I want to sum up are the, are the corresponding sales relating to the motorcycles. 
So this combines the if and the sum, and now we know the total for motorcycles was was that. So in essence, all, all the sum if function is doing is it's going through here, and if these are motorcycle values, it's it's summing up the values that are related to those values. So this is where it's a lot more useful in combining the sum if than just using an if statement and saying, okay, if this value if this value is a motorcycle, take the sales value, otherwise make it zero, and then sum that up. But with the sum if function, you can do that all in one. And there's an even more powerful sum ifs function, which allows you to apply multiple criteria. So first we start with the sum range, and then we've got one criteria range, criteria for that range, a second criteria range, a second criteria, and so on and so on. So you can keep on going. So you can get really complicated with these sum ifs. So that's why it's really important to know how these if functions work because they're used in other functions like the average if function. There's an average if, there's an average ifs function. So the if function is used a lot in Excel. That's why it's really important to, to know how, how it works. The next function I'm gonna cover is the end of month function, EO month. And so in accounting, obviously you're, you're dealing with deadlines a, lo a lot and need to calculate uh, due dates, let's say. So in this data set, we've got an order date. And let's say we wanna calculate an order due date. And this order due date is gonna be, is gonna tell us the, the day that these orders need to go out by, right? So let's set a deadline for when they have to, uh, when the items need to be shipped. So they order this day, and let's say they need to be shipped out on the end, uh, by the end of the following month, okay? So for that, we'd use the EO month function, and our start date is gonna be this date. Now, if we just wanted to get the end of the current month, then we'd enter the month's argument as zero. So you'll notice, now the one thing you wanna watch out for is the formatting. So if your, your date looks like series numbers, make sure you convert it into into a date format like this. So now you can see February 29th, 2020, that was the end of the month for this month, which was February, 2020. But if we wanna jump ahead one month and say, okay, we want it the end of the following month, then we can just, just enter a one here. And now it becomes March 31, 2020. So I can copy this down. And now just like that, I've got an order due date that I've set up for each one of these orders. For this next function, I'm still gonna, be working with dates and this time I'm going to use the today function. The today function is really helpful because it uh, returns today's date. So if I enter it in today, it's going to give me today's value. So March 28th, that's what I'm doing this video. So that's always going to update. So you don't need to, you know, change it manually if you're always wanting to calculate the distance from today's date to a past date or a future date. It's a really convenient way to do so. So let's use this with our order due dates. So I'm gonna insert a, another, another column here. And for this field, I'm gonna say days since the due date. So any date values that are in the past are gonna be lower, are gonna be smaller numbers than the value for today's date. And any future dates will be greater values. So if I wanna know the number of days that have passed since these due dates, I can use the today function. And this one doesn't take any arguments, so you just open and close parentheses and then subtract the previous one. Because really, these are still numbers in Excel, but it's being but they're being treated as, as dates. So we're really, that's why the minusing still works because we're st these are still numerical values because as I showed you before, by default, they can be converted into, into numbers if you don't uh, change them to a date format. So I enter this. You see it's still stuck in a date format. I can change this down to a number, get rid of the decimals. So 1,092 days since that, since that due date. Copy this down, and you can see you know, 2020 dates are a bit closer. So <clears throat> that's an easy way to um, you know, calculate deadlines or if you need to know let's say how, how, how late a receivable is, that sort of thing. You can use the today function and that will automatically update. So, you know, if tomorrow I went in and opened this spreadsheet up, 
this number would be 1093. I don't need a macro. I don't need to manually change anything. The today function will automatically pull in today's date. That's why it's really useful because for deadlines, for stuff like that, it will automatically update. You don't need to do anything extra with it. Next, I'm going to switch over to some loan calculation functions. I'm going to start with the future value function, FV. So the future value function will tell you you know what the value of let's say an investment will be uh in the future x amount of years in the future so for this just fv got the future value of an investment right so we specify the rate so let's say we were we have a rate of zero point or five percent we enter at 0 0.05 the number of periods that we're going to be making the payment for so let's say we're doing this for five years and we're making a payment of ten thousand dollars a year now i'm going to enter this as a negative otherwise the form is going to return a negative negative value for me so it'll tell me that basically if i invest ten thousand dollars a year earning five percent per year then it'll be worth about fifty five thousand dollars similarly there's also a present value calculation which as you can imagine does the opposite it takes a future value takes a future value and brings it back to today so for the present value calculation the arguments are going to be pretty similar we're going to start with the interest rate again it stays at 0 0.05 the number of periods are five the payment amount that's going to be that ten thousand dollars the future value we know is going to be this amount 55256.31 and again I'm going to enter that as a negative 55256.31 and on these present value uh, future value calculations you have the option to set whether the payments are made at the beginning or at the end of a period by default they're they're set to argument to zero the end of the period so if you don't leave it that's what it's going to default to but you can change it to that if you want to uh, change it to the beginning of the period so now the present value returns a value of zero which is correct because in this argument we did not specify a value for the present value right so it was set to zero so this is a good way to sort of check your calculations or if you need to actually pull in a future value into um, today's dollars today's value there's also the payment calculation uh, uh, function that you can use in this example let's let's use um, mortgage for instance so for PMT it's again it's gonna be similar arguments but let's say we're paying a five hundred thousand dollar mortgage and the payments are monthly so in these previous examples I used you know just annual payments to keep it simple but if we're doing monthly then what we do we want to do is take our interest rate 0.05 divided by 12 so it's on a monthly basis the number of periods Let's take 30 years multiply that by 12 as well we want to make sure our periods are monthly and our rate is monthly as well so everything's consistent for the present value we enter a negative five hundred thousand dollars because think of it as you know you have a balance outstanding today of minus five hundred one two three five hundred thousand that you need to pay back and the future value is going to be zero because it's going to be paid off so if we close that out that is what our monthly payment would need to be on uh, the mortgage with those 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 parameters next up what I'm going to cover is a lot of people's favorite function VLOOKUP so VLOOKUP is really common and popular just because it's it's so easy to use and at the same time so incredibly useful so how it works is let's say we want to look up an order number and find a corresponding uh, value whether it's sales whether it's the price quantity order whatever the case may be let's say we want to do a lookup to find that value so for VLOOKUP we enter a lookup value let's say I want to look up this order 10318 so I could reference the cell or I could just hard code it in there it's it's, it's better to, to reference the cell but for the sake of uh, making this easy to follow I'm just going to put in the actual value that I'm looking up then we're going to set our table array so you with VLOOKUP, one of the limitations is that you need to uh, include the value you're looking up in the leftmost column. So I could not do this, right? If I want to pull the sales amount, I can't 
use this as my range. I have to start with this, right? And let's say I want to pull the sales. I can't go up to here because that's going to be not within my range, right? I can go here or further. It doesn't matter. But I have to include at least the column that I want to extract from. Otherwise, I'll get an error. So C to G is my range and the column index number. So if you look up, I need to specify the column number that I want to extract from. So this is the first column, second column, third, fourth, and fifth. So sales are in the fifth column. So that's going to be a number five. And the range lookup, I'm looking for an exact match. If you use approximate, you may not get the result that you want. So uh, in most cases, you're, you're going to want to set it to an exact match. So this is going to give you that sales um, sales value here. So that matches up to that. So as you can see, really easy way to get data. The one limitation is, you know, I couldn't um, go backwards if I had data here. I couldn't take the order number and, and move left, but I'll show you how we can get around that using other functions. So one, of, one function that uh, is, is also helpful is the index function. With the index function, you can you can also do lookups, and you know you you basically can set where you want to intersect um, in, in a table. So let's say we can select this entire array, or we can just set a single call. Like let's say we know that the sales that value we want to pull from is from row twenty. So we can set just a single column as our array, and for the row number, let's say we enter. Row 20, because we know row 20 is order 10318. And the column number, well, there's only one column. And I'll show you if you if you enter in two, just as in V lookup, you know, there's not two columns in here. So what I'm going to get is a ref error, a reference error, saying this is a problem with the column that I'm referencing. So I need to set this to one because there's only one column. And you can see, again, same value as when I did the V lookup. Next up, I'm going to use the match function. And the match function is useful because, you know, in the, in the previous example where I used index, you know, I, I manually put in row 20, right? That's not really practical because now I'm manually having to go through here and find 10318 and key that in. It's not, it's not a good way to build a formula if I was hard coding these values in. So the match function can be useful in this case because now, let's say I know I want to look up order 10318. I don't know where in this range it is, but Excel, go go find it for me. I'm going to look for exact match type, which again is going to be in most cases where you're going to be looking for. And I'm going to look for that value in that range. And it tells me it's on row 20. And so these two functions, index and match, are what a lot of accountants do uh, use instead of VLOOKUP to... Um, to adjust for its shortcomings in the sense of not being able to move left and right and, and stuff like that. So index and match, how it works is, you know, we create an index uh, index uh, function and we can create this entire array now because we're not just looking at a single uh, column. We can, we can make it broader than that, right? Or what we could do is specify just that one, one column if we want to, either way, it, it can work both ways, but I'll show you an example of how we do it in the entire uh, entire data set. So once I've set that array, now we can use the match function within here to say, okay, let's look up 10318 within this column. Match type is zero, one exact match. And now let's also do a search across the column headers. Let's say we want to find or actually, wrong format. Let's say we want to look up the sales. Put the wrong first argument in the wrong place. So let's say we want to find sales within these headers. Match type is also zero. So now we close this out, and now we still get that value. So let's open up this formula and show you what it's doing. It's doing a lot of stuff in here. So first, we're creating, we're setting that range from column C to column B, and we're doing a match function on column C to find 10318, right? That gives us the value of 20. That's the, the 20th row in this data set. But we also need to figure out the column number. 
So for the column number, we're doing another match function. This time it's for sales. Again, looking at these headers, it's finding where sales is. Sales is in the fifth column, right? So by doing this, you can, you know, make your formulas a lot more dynamic. You know, ideally you'd be referencing sales in a cell. You'd be referencing this order number in a cell, not hard coding in there, but this is just an example to show you how, how this formula works and why it's incredibly useful to use you know, index and match because of the capability of it being able to go in both directions. It's not limited as VLOOKUP is. And you know, if you just wanted to extract from one column, you could just select an array that is just one column. In this example, I selected the entire data set. But if you set it to one column, then you don't have to worry about counting what column it is or doing another match function. But just wanted to show you as an example. Now, if you are using Office 365 and on a newer version of Excel, there is XLOOKUP, and you may be wondering why I went with VLOOKUP and index and match instead of XLOOKUP. But the reason I, I, I actually prefer using these functions is because they're gonna be compatible with older versions of Excel. If you're an accountant, you know, you're working for uh, companies that you know maybe haven't upgraded to the latest version of Excel, you might be stuck on Excel 2007, Excel 2010, you might be thinking, okay, great, well, I can't use XLOOKUP. That's why I include these functions because they're gonna work on those older versions of Excel, whereas XLOOKUP is not. But I'll show you XLOOKUP anyways. So XLOOKUP is a really simpler version of VLOOKUP that does everything that VLOOKUP should do. And so instead of using VLOOKUP or index match, you can just use the XLOOKUP, and it's really simple. So again, we're specifying the lookup value 10318 within this range and then really simply we're telling okay so that's the range you're going to look for where you're going to look for the value and then the return array so this is going to be wh which column we want to pull the values from so we select g so we don't have to count any columns we don't have to specify an array no index and match right it's effectively doing that match for us there by saying look up that amount in that column and then just get that corresponding value so that's XLOOKUP. So exact same way, obviously a whole lot easier, but I'll look at it this way. It's more important to know index and match for the sake of being able to know how to structure these formulas. Because obviously these are a lot more complicated than an XLOOKUP. XLOOKUP is incredibly simple, but the advantage of knowing how to do index and match is you learn how to structure these more complex formulas. And again, they're going to be more, you're going to be able to use them on older versions of Excel, which is, you know, you want that flexibility so that way you, you don't go to your boss and say, I can't, I can't do this. We don't have X lookup, so I don't know how to do this, right? You want to be able to have something that's going to work on older machines on older versions of Excel. Next up, let's do the count if function. So count if is, is useful if you just want to calculate the number of values that reach that media criteria. Again, we're using that if function again. So that's why it's really important to know how, how it works. So for the count if function, we're selecting a range and then a criteria. It's really just an if statement again, ex except it's just gonna be an entire range we're selecting. So in this case, we're selecting all of column M and we're gonna put motorcycles. So simple enough, it's gonna count the number of times and I'm just gonna format this as a number. It's gonna count the number of times that it finds that, that text in there. So simple enough. Another function that's similar is the count a function. This one actually has no criteria whatsoever. All it's gonna do is count the number of non-blank values. So this is a good way to count just how, uh, how many values are in your data set. So if I select column C, it's gonna count how many values are in here. So 2,824. So if I select all this, you know, go down here, I can see the count is 2824, right? So a really simple way to do that. So this is a way to check um, uh, how many cells are, are, are filled in. So theoretically, if there's no blanks, there's no gaps in your data, these values should be all the same. If for instance, let's say one value is missing, you know, now it's gonna be 2823 for that column because you know I, I deleted something else, something's missing. So that's how you can use that. Another relatively new function in Excel that's, that's useful is the unique function. And 
how the unique function works is it's going to give you a list of unique values. So there's a lot of ways that you can um, get unique values in Excel, but now it's available to do it just through a simple function. So let's say I'm going to make some space down here and let's say I want my unique values showing in here. So if I use the unique um, function, I, I just have to select a range here. Let's go back to a product line. And that's it. And now what it's gonna do is return everything that shows up at least once in there. And so I've got my list of unique values in there. So this includes the header. So if you um, if you don't wanna include it, you could just adjust the adjust this. Let's say M2 to let's say M, let's say M3000, right? Do like that. So we get rid of that header. So you can adjust that range if you don't want to include it in there. Now you've got a list of everything that shows up, even the blanks. Now, another thing you can do is combine this inside of the count a function. And what this will do is it'll count the number of unique values. So again, this is helpful in, in knowing how to embed these functions within one another. So we have the count a function and within that we have the unique function. So the unique function is going to spit out a list of these unique values and then the count a function is going to count how many there are in there. So, I'm going to use the unique function again, select column M, close that out, and it gives us a value of 9. So we can go to formulas, evaluate formula to see exactly what it's doing. So the unique function, see it's giving us all those values again, so I removed product line from there. But now the count A function is going to count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. So you've got to set 9. So it's counting that list. So just like it was counting this list here, it's counting that list within that array. So that wraps up the 15 plus functions that I covered on this video. The, the one thing, uh, a couple things I guess I'll note is that, you know, when you're doing these, when you're using these functions, you know, be careful of the formatting, specifically when you're doing with dates and numbers, because, you know, as I showed you earlier, you know, if this is formatted as a number, you may think that your formula is looking wrong, but it could just be that it just needs to be formatted properly as a date versus if it's in a number format. Another thing that's also um, generally helpful is to avoid hard coding values. Like in this example, I used index and match and looked up a value of 10318 for the order number. A better, a better way to, to do that is, let's say if I had a field for order number, 10318, and then inside my index and match, instead of hard coding this value now, I'm referencing that cell. And that's gonna be useful because it's it's a lot easier to just change this one value and have multiple formulas linking to it, as opposed to going into, let's say, multiple formulas and adjusting these values in there. So now let's say if I wanna look up 10150, I can just change it in here, 10150 and my formula here has updated. So that's, that's a lot better way, it's a much better way to build your formulas as opposed to hard coding. Generally, you wanna avoid the situation, the temptation to type in things like that, even, even sales. Ideally, you're referencing values that are somewhere else where it's easy to update, where you have all your inputs in one section and your formulas in another that are just referencing that. It's gonna make your, your formulas a lot cleaner and easier to use. So. Hope you found this video useful. Let me know in the comments if you think uh, I missed any important functions or what you thought. Thank you for watching.